Greetings psychology students, et al. Now, this was an area that caused a degree of confusion with my students in the first year of a new study design. And that's because of the common ground that the basal ganglia and the cerebellum share on a, in a broad sense, because both of them play a key role in the day-to-day -day mode of functioning and to a degree mode of learning. And they also play a major role in implicit memory. Memories that are non-declarative that we don't need to consciously recall. So I want to cover three points of difference that I'll illustrate with some practical examples after this slide. But let's just start with three key differences. First of all, the role in movement. The cerebellum has a broader role in terms of gross movements, coordinating the movement so that it occurs in a unitary manner, such as running, the way you sit in a car and your body position when you're driving, sitting, etc. Your basal ganglia is involved more in the finer motor movements so that they're occurring with fluidity and with precision. I want to talk a little bit about the feedback loop, more synonymous with the basal ganglia, but I want to touch on the cerebellum because what the basal ganglia does is it relies on um, feedback, both positive and negative, so that when we perform an, an, a behavior, an action, and we get a desired result, so there's a degree of operant conditioning going on here, we're more likely to repeat that. Now we don't need external feedback, it's just something that comes from within. And when we perform an action or behavior and we get a bad outcome, then we'll adjust that future uh, habitual approach. Now with your cerebellum, there's also a, a feedback loop occurring with body parts. And I'll touch on this with an example later, but basically we're getting feedback from our arm positioning, our leg positioning, and we're making adjustments in real time, which I'll get to a bit later. Now, in terms of inhibitory and excitatory effects, the cerebellum just basically has an excitatory effect on um, body parts and their movements. Whereas the basal ganglia does a bit of both through that feedback loop that I was talking about earlier. For instance, through dopamine, the release of dopamine, um, that will have some excitatory effects on body parts that will basically cause the movements to occur more often, e.g. our wrist action when we're serving a tennis ball, etc., our leg movements, that type of thing when we're doing something fancy like a dance, but also some inhibitory actions to prevent unnecessary movements, to stop um, movements that are occurring in a, sequ a sequential fashion, so that we can, again, perform these movements with fluidity and precision. Again, I'll illustrate this a bit later. Some examples, and the main ones that you need to look out for on SACs or VCAR exams, is the basal, basal ganglia, where not only we're we looking at fine tuning of movements, encoding and retrieval of those, but also um, habit forming, habitual learning. Whereas with your cerebellum, look out for clues, particularly with classically conditioned reflexive movements like an eye blink or something like that. So let's consolidate our understanding of these concepts with some practical examples. Now I've got four children, child number three, got his license in June this year. So last summer, he was banking his hours with me as his co-pilot instructor. And we were basically clocking up hours in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. Now, we live in Box Hill South. Box Hill South is the roundabout capital of Melbourne. That's an anecdotal statement because I'm not going to back that up with any evidence. And basically what he had the most difficulty with when he was banking his hours was navigating his way smoothly through a roundabout. So what he would do would be he'd approach the roundabout and he'd make his move in terms of changing his line a bit too late. So therefore he'd have to turn sharply when he entered the roundabout 
and then he'd have to kind of kick out and he'd basically come out on a pretty dodgy angle and then he'd veer onto the other side of the road. Not an issue when there's no one else around. Major issue when there's oncoming traffic. I tried to give him explicit feedback. That didn't work because driving is more of an implicit skill. So over time, and when I say over time, I'd estimate that it probably took him, oh geez, maybe 40, 50 hours into his actual uh, logbook before he actually got to the point where he could confidently nail his approach to the roundabout. And so what he did was basically he learnt through um, a feedback loop in his brain that if I follow the pathway here and start to manoeuvre the car just before, in terms of changing the line, just before we enter the roundabout and then basically try and hold a tangent position through the roundabout and then start correcting in terms of straightening up just as we exit the roundabout, then we come, back, come through nice and smoothly. So what was happening there was his basal ganglia was receiving feedback from the cortex going, I nailed that approach and that exit of the roundabout. And so now, six months on, um, when he approaches a roundabout, it's, he implicitly makes his move in terms of when to start turning, when to stop turning, so that he can focus on everything else. So again, it's a feedback loop that's occurring with the conscious part of his cortex feeding in with the basal ganglia. He's getting positive feedback in terms of the outcome when he smoothly navigates his way through the roundabout. Second example, this time let's focus on the feedback loop that I touched on before with the cerebellum. Now, I used to be a competitive runner. I'm a couple of minutes past my prime, I will concede. Um, and I've done a bit of um, Treadmill running. Now, treadmill running, you might think is fairly simple, but there's a lot of moving body parts. You're in a finite space. So what tends to happen when you first jump on a treddy, particularly as you're adjusting speeds, etc., is you might bang into things, or maybe it's just me. So what would happen would be that my hand might bang into the side um, of the actual treddy. Or maybe your foot might bang into the front part, etc. I've never fallen off, by the way. Um, and so what will happen is your cerebellum will basically receive feedback from your hand, your foot, etc. And then your body will make some, some adjustments so that we don't kind of whack into the sides of the treadmill. So again, the feedback is occurring outside of the brain with the body parts as opposed to the basal ganglia where the feedback loop is occurring within the brain. Okay, another example, um, darts. The, the World Darts Championships are on at the moment. That's kind of a guilty pleasure of mine, um, watching those over the summer. Now, darts looks pretty easy. Um, and if you think it's easy, next time you go to someone's house who's got a dart board set up, grab three, see how you go when you aim for the bullseye. A lot harder than it looks. And one of the things that's really hard about darts is you've got to basically keep one side of your body fairly sit still. So if you're a right hander, um, and if you think about, say, throwing a ball, uh, throwing a cricket ball, softball, serving a ball in tennis, etc., there, there's a rotation of your torso that occurs. Now, in darts, that's the natural enemy. Because that causes, if you're throwing the dart and your um, off shoulder is rotating, then your dart will not go towards the intended target. So what your basal ganglia does um, is it enables you to have some inhibitory effects on the parts of the body that we don't want moving. Again, it's relying on a feedback loop. So therefore, through hours and hours of practice, um, the dart player will focus on their stance. They'll focus on basically their take back on, on their actual throw, on their follow through. Um, and there'll be some inhibitory effects on the on their opposite shoulder, et cetera, even their, their torso movements so that we minimize and prevent unnecessary movements so we can get an optimal throw. Now there's some excitatory effects occurring for the body parts that are basically doing the most work, the wrist, the elbow, the shoulder on the throwing arm, et cetera. 
Now, that all occurs um, through hours and hours of repetition. Let's look at a classically conditioned reflex because the cerebellum, this learning can occur quite rapidly. E.g., you're at a golf course, somebody yells out four and you get hit. Four, F-O-R-E, is universal language for look out, I've hit a ball, I've got no idea where it's coming, brace yourself. So therefore, if somebody gets hit on a golf course after hearing four, um, and that happens a couple of times, then four, hearing four on a golf course will become a conditioned stim, um, stimulus. And then the condition response is that reflexive movement of bracing yourself, ducking, putting your hands on your head. So that is a far more simplistic process, far more rapid, requires less uh, repetition than that kind of complex stuff of throwing a dart.